Hello, everybody. I'm Jeannie Hoffman Sensitz. I'm a medical oncologist and um, I'm an assistant professor in the departments of medical oncology and urology here at uh, the Sidney Kimmel Comprehensive Cancer Center at Johns Hopkins and part of our Greenberg Bladder Cancer Institute. And I'm so excited to talk to you about updates on the treatment of advanced bladder cancer. So bladder cancer is a very common disease. It's the fourth most common cancer in men and the eighth most common uh, cause of cancer death in men. Although a lot of patients and families don't really hear about it um, until they or someone that they love is diagnosed with bladder cancer. And when we talk about bladder cancer, really we're talking about the urothelial or what used to be called the transitional cell carcinoma underneath the microscope. These more rare but very important subtypes like squamous cell, endocarcinoma, and small cell, important but less is known about them. And really the majority of the data uh, that we'll be talking about today is in uh, predominantly urothelial cancer or mixed subtypes. So the majority of patients uh, who uh, develop bladder cancer have an early stage bladder cancer. And for the most part, those patients um, go on to do very well. Today, we'll be talking about those that have locally advanced lymph node positive, as well as recurrent or metastatic disease, who really traditionally have not done as well. Under the microscope, these advanced cancers tend to be high grade, what you see on the right hand side, as opposed to low grade tumors that tend to recur, but may not be life-threatening within the bladder. So who gets this disease? Bladder cancer is a disease of older population. The average age of our patients that we see in clinic is about 73 years old. And for reasons we don't completely understand, um, the, the majority of patients, about um, three to one or four to one are men. But when women get the disease, they do tend to get um, a, a, a worse disease that can present at a later stage and have a worse prognosis. Like lung cancer, it is a smoking related disease. And because of age and other risk factors, a lot of our patients will have comorbid hearing loss, problems with renal function, cardiovascular issues, peripheral neuropathy, and challenges with functional status that make treatment eligibility a challenge in our population. So let's talk about locally advanced and metastatic urothelial cancer. Honestly, it's been exciting and somewhat dizzying in the past couple of years, all the new FDA approvals that we have for this disease. We know that cisplatin is a backbone of our treatment and has been around um, since I've been around in the 1970s. But since 2016, we've had multiple new FDA approvals in different disease spaces with several different agents, which we'll highlight today. Things used to be easy and these talks were very short. Um, back up until about the spring of 2016. Patients who were completely ineligible to get chemotherapy got best supportive care, and patients who were eligible to get chemotherapy in the first line would either get cisplatin and gemcitabine or MVAC or carboplatin and gemcitabine. So as of today, when you look at the first line treatment for patients with bladder cancer, we still think about those patients who are eligible or ineligible to get cisplatin but there have been some additions um, to this data. So let's talk about those patients who are completely chemotherapy ineligible. Maybe those patients that have a performance status of three or um, have a renal function that is so poor, you would be hesitant to even give them um, carboplatin-based chemotherapy. So we know that we can give those patients immunotherapy in the frontline. And we've learned a little bit about the differences between chemotherapy and immunotherapy in the frontline from Invigor 130 and some other combination frontline trials. But what I wanted to highlight was those patients um, in this clinical trial that were randomized to the atezolizumab monotherapy group versus those patients who got um, a placebo plus platinum-based chemotherapy. And in this study, what we could see is that those patients where their tumor um, had a high expression of um, PDL1 uh, denoted with PDL1 IC2 or 3, um, they actually did um, even a lot better than those patients that get chemotherapy in this um, blue line, as opposed to those with PDL1 low tumors where chemotherapy um, was better. So um, this is important, and one of the um, kind of restrictions uh, on the label of uh, thinking about giving our patients frontline um, immunotherapy instead of chemotherapy 
um, it is important to, dis to discern whether or not those patients are eligible to get chemotherapy because clearly if they aren't eligible to get chemotherapy and their PDL1 low, um, I think this slide really highlights that chemotherapy is an important in the front line. And we now have two choices in the front line for that group of patients. <clears throat> There's data back from 2017 supporting atezolizumab as frontline treatment, as well as pembrolizumab as frontline treatment. So even though in urothelial cancer, we have five checkpoint inhibitors that are FDA approved, there's only data to support two of them, atezolizumab or pembrolizumab in the front line if a patient has not gotten any chemotherapy. So let's take a look at this space. Um, this is new uh, as of the uh, summertime of 2020, looking at immunotherapy maintenance with Evalumab. This was uh, recently published in the New England Journal of Medicine. This was the Javelin 100 study, looking at patients who had gotten chemotherapy with either cisplatin and gemcitabine or carboplatin and gemcitabine in the front line and had a clinical benefit, either a complete response, a partial response, or stable disease. They had a little bit of a treatment break with some follow-up scans, and then were randomized to receive a Valumab ongoing every two weeks, um, standard dosing and schedule, or best supportive care alone, looking at a primary endpoint of overall survival. So who came into this clinical trial? So um, about the age that we expect to see patients with urothelial cancer, both in the upper tract and the ureter and renal pelvis, as well as the lower tract, which is bladder. And then we often delineate patients that have visceral metastatic disease, meaning lung, liver, bone, compared to those who have non-visceral metastatic disease, like lymph node only, because those patients tend to have a better prognosis. So in our clinical trials, we're always going to be looking at that, as well as delineated by um, pdl one status and what kind of chemotherapy patients got, as well as whether or not they had an upfront response to chemotherapy um, versus stable disease to upfront chemotherapy. And what we saw uh, in this clinical trial was a really significant improvement in overall survival. Just giving a Valumab as a maintenance therapy following platinum-based chemotherapy for patients who had a clinical benefit, uh, they did much better just starting right in with that treatment uh, compared to patients who got best supportive care alone with median overall survival of 21.4 versus 14.3 months. So this was pretty staggering, and even more so in the pdl one positive uh, population in the top corner there. Uh, the other thing that was seen is um, patients that went on to have additional um, complete and or partial responses in the overall population in getting um, additional uh, therapy with the value map. So this is um, really uh, an important study and has changed standard of care in the last 12 months. So if we know that patients can get immunotherapy in the frontline uh, select group of patients, and we know that uh, maintenance immunotherapy uh, is an important uh, tool to improve overall survival, what about putting these two things together? We know that this works in other diseases like lung cancer. So there are multiple clinical trials that are ongoing, including this one on the bottom that I stuck in called the Nile study. And we do have some readouts from some of these clinical trials where immunotherapy, combination immunotherapy with chemotherapy was combined to chemotherapy. So I just want to give a little highlight of what we know about these studies so far. Two of them have read out as negative, two of them are completely pending, and the Invigor 130 study has some early data. So this was published in uh, Lancet of 2020. Um, this design, similar to the others, looking at uh, immunotherapy um, plus um, chemotherapy with platinum and gemcitabine, um, immunotherapy alone, or platinum plus, uh, or um, placebo um, with uh, chemotherapy. Um, important as we talk about the comorbidities of patients with urothelial cancer, these are the comorbidities that we face um, both in our clinical practice as well as we're thinking about patients on clinical trials. Patients have renal impairment, hearing loss, peripheral neuropathy, and impairment in functional status, which um, help us delineate whether or not a, a, someone is a candidate or not a candidate for cisplatin-based chemotherapy. And really, at the end of the day, it's oftentimes 50% of patients or more, and in this study, 70% of patients wound up not getting platinum-based chemotherapy um, and carboplatin instead of cisplatin. 
So when you look at the median progression free survival, which was the primary endpoint that was reported in this clinical trial, um, getting uh, atezolizumab plus platinum-based chemotherapy, there was a median PFS of 8.2 months versus 6.3 months in the patients who had uh, chemotherapy alone. And um, an uh, interval analysis of uh, overall survival has been reported in this clinical trial as well. Importantly, if we look at the different arms in this clinical trial and broken down by which patients tended to benefit, we can see that this um, significant number of patients that got carboplatin over cisplatin um, uh, potentially impacts the results, but more to come when the survival data are ultimately presented for this clinical trial. So what about getting immunotherapy in the second line? So as I said, there are five uh, checkpoint inhibitors FDA approved in the second line, pembrolizumab, atezolizumab, nivolumab, durvalumab, and avalumab. Avalumab is the only one that's FDA approved for maintenance therapy, but all five can be given um, in the second line. All five of them have um, either phase one or phase two data. Pembrolizumab has phase three data, and I just wanted to highlight that um, here. So um, in this study that was published in um, 2017 in the New England Journal, um, patients who had gotten platinum-based chemotherapy were randomized either to get pembrolizumab or dealer's choice chemotherapy with a taxane-based chemotherapy or um, uh, nav navalbine in, um, in the uh, in European um, uh, 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 sites. In addition to pembrolizumab improving um, overall survival, again, um, uh, producing level one evidence um, to give this drug in the second line, um, patients that were randomized to the pembrolizumab arm had a better overall quality of life and um, significantly um, less impact on things like fatigue, nausea, vomiting, and pain, insomnia, things that are, I think, pretty standard to us and understanding giving these drugs um, to our patient population but I think important to see when you compare them um, head to head. So um, what about in the um, kind of second line and beyond in terms of patients who have disease progression um, post um, platinum based chemotherapy? Uh, so one of the things that's important in urothelial cancer is thinking about um, um, next generation sequencing because we do have a targeted therapy that is FDA approved. I know a lot of us have seen um, these uh, commercial um, next gener generation sequencing reports. There's multiple different companies. Um, some uh, centers use internal um, sequencing. Some use these, these um, third parties, but be that as it may, it is important to recognize um, that in patients that have recurrent or metastatic urothelial cancer, that getting the sequencing report is, um, I think at this point, uh, quite important and considered standard of care because in part we're looking for is um, this alteration, whether or not it's present or absent. So having an FGFR3 um, alteration will tell us whether or not a patient is a candidate uh, for this medication called ertafitinib. So ertafitinib was FDA approved in 2019 and is a potent oral tyrosine kinase inhibitor um, of the fibroblast growth factor um, pathway. Um, mutations in, uh, or fusions in FGFR2 or 3 are present in about 20% of bladder cancers, but really importantly also seen at a much higher um, um, uh, presence in upper tract urothelial cancer in the ureter and in the renal pelvis. So in a phase two um, single arm study that um, was led by Arlene C. Baraki, um, most patients who received the eight milligram, which is the standard dosing of daily um, ertafitinib did have um, tumor shrinkage. And it was really independent of whether or not they had an FGFR um, mutation or a fusion. The confirmed um, response rate was 40% with a 3% complete response rate. So it's really, really important. The other thing, as I had mentioned earlier, is that um, you know, we delineate patients as to whether or not they have you know, sites of visceral metastatic disease or lymph node only disease, and this drug did not discriminate. So these responses were seen across the board of whether or not patients had visceral metastasis or not. 
in terms of side effect profile, there was um, there's definitely side effects of, um, uh, associated with this targeted therapy. Uh, hyperphosphatemia is an on-target effect, as well as mucositis, GI toxicity, skin and nail changes, as well as ocular toxicity, which is not something that we're used to as much in urothelial carcinoma with something called central serous retinopathy. So these patients should be seen by ophthalmology at baseline and then followed pretty closely for this uh, Um, what about this medication called Enfertumab Vidotin? So there have been several publications on EV um, since the, the original phase one came out. This is the phase two study, a pivotal uh, trial of Enfertumab Vidotin in patients with disease progression, so um, post-platinum-based chemotherapy and checkpoint inhibitor therapy. So what is Enfertumab Vidotin? EV is an antibody drug conjugate, um, which is... Um, a fully humanized monoclonal antibody targeting nectin-4, which is a pretty ubiquitous um, self-surface protein expressed on urothelial um, cancer cells. Um, and it is attached uh, to a linker um, um, with a payload of um, MMAE as, uh, uh, um, as the uh, uh, chemotherapeutic agent. Like what we saw in uh, the impressive waterfall plot for patients treated on ertafitinib, similarly here with Enfertumab Vidotin in the third line setting, um, there was an impressive uh, tumor shrinkage rate as well as an impressive overall response rate or ejected response rate of 44%, including patients with complete um, responses of 12%. Uh, just like in the other targeted therapy with ertafitinib, Patients with liver um, and other visceral metastasis also had um, significant responses. So it really was not predicated on where their disease was found. In terms of side effect profile on this medic, on um, uh, this therapy, um, rash is something that we're seeing a lot and the, um, there's um, more coming out about this. Fatigue, uh, decrease in appetite, sensory neuropathy can be um, dose limiting, uh, getting out to the higher number of cycles um, as well as uh, hyperglycemia. When um, this medication uh, was capped at a, uh, a, a top dosing of 125 milligrams um, um, based on weight-based dosing, some of those um, toxicities um, did start to improve compared to the earlier phase one studies um, where the patients um, uh, who were heavier had um, higher uh, degree of toxicities. And this is just an example of um, some of what you can see in terms of rash. So recently, um, that was a phase two study that I showed you. Recently, there was a phase three study actually hot off the press, um, published in the New England Journal of Medicine, looking at um, the comparison of Enfertumab Vidotin uh, compared to dealer's choice chemotherapy in the third line. Uh, with an improvement in median overall survival of 12.88 months compared to 8.97 months. And again, showing that these patients um, were heavily pretreated and also had um, a significant, significant number of patients that had either liver metastasis or other um, visceral metastasis. Um, really, the, uh, across the board, for the most part, um, uh, the um, Breakdown really tended to favor infertumab, um, uh, which was important. And then the side effect profile, pretty similar to what we had seen um, previously. Um, so the question is, is kind of getting back to, um, you know, how we've been thinking about this disease for a long period of time. We always in the frontline setting uh, decide whether or not patients are eligible or ineligible to receive cisplatin-based chemotherapy. And if they're ineligible, they um, receive carboplatin and gemcitabine, which we've known for a long period of time is inferior to um, cisplatin-based regimens. So the question is, is it time to start thinking about changing this dogma? And the answer is hopefully yes. Um, so I wanted to um, end on a note, um, a higher note, and highlight one of the um, ongoing um, phase three clinical trials um, in urothelial cancer, um, which I think is important. Uh, before I do that, I wanted to give you information about this clinical trial. So this was a study looking at pembrolizumab, 
which we tend to give in the second line, um, plus n for tumab, which we give in the third line, um, putting those two drugs together in patients who were ineligible to receive cisplatin in the first line. Um, the, the dosing schedule on the uh, n for tumab was um, somewhat modified in, 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 um, in this regimen, where instead of three weekly doses, patients received two weekly doses plus the pembrolizumab. And um, as you can see, the waterfall plot in terms of uh, tumor shrinkage rate was very impressive here with a confirmed response rate of 73%, including 15% of patients um, that had a complete response. And this combination is a, a comparator arm in a large randomized phase three study in patients with uh, newly diagnosed recurrent urothelial cancer, randomizing them to receive this novel combination of n Bidotin plus pembrolizumab versus either gemcitabine and cisplatin or carboplatin, depending on eligibility. So this is a, an important ongoing study. So in summary, since 2016, there have been seven new agents FDA approved in five separate disease states for urothelial cancer. As of today, cisplatin remains the um, perioperative standard of care, as well as the standard of care um, in the front line. Uh, with carboplatin um, for patients who are ineligible to receive cisplatin. The data for checkpoint inhibitors so far is potentially better in sequence rather than combination. Um, however, we are waiting for several large phase three uh, trials to read out and complete. Both ertafitinib and infertumab are active in patients with hepatic and other visceral metastasis, post-platinum-based chemotherapy and checkpoint inhibitor therapy. Novel combinations are very promising and may allow us to treat a broader population of patients with active therapy in the front line. But we have many questions that remain, including how to combine these uh, agents, when to sequence them, thinking about patients that have rare urothelial cancer variant histology, those with upper tract urothelial cancer. We know women do um, more poorly, do these uh, drugs work differently? How do we mitigate some of the toxicity, including overlapping toxicities like peripheral neuropathy? And how do we think about treatment refractory disease? I want to thank you for the invitation and highlight our wonderful team here at the Greenberg, uh, Johns Hopkins Greenberg Bladder Cancer Institute. Thank you so very much.